a pleasure. Good morning to one and all. Welcome, welcome to this episode of Speaking Out, Exposing Corruption and Incompetence. Today is Wednesday, April the 3rd, 20 of 2024. So welcome one and all to this Wednesday episode. I know it has been a, a long time. The last program we had was last Wednesday, one week ago, and it seems such a long, 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 long time. But here we are. Here we are ready. Um, to go to give you the information on this um, midweek. And, you know, we're coming after a, a long uh, weekend, holiday weekend. I hope you enjoyed the Easter weekend. You had um, Good Friday, then you had Easter Saturday, Easter Sunday, and then um, Easter Monday, four straight days of um, relaxation, I would think, even though some of you would have um, taken that opportunity to have fun, to gyrate and to enjoy yourself. I hope you did enjoy the Easter uh, weekend. So here we are. Welcome, welcome. You know, as we did say, we, there was no program on Monday because Monday was Easter Monday. And that is a big family holiday um, in Guyana. And um, so I hope you're ready and um, rearing to take in all the lessons that we have to teach today. Once again, today we have so much um, to tell you so much. And my colleague, Mr. Conway, is already in the studio. He's anxiously awaiting his turn to bring you some information. But as we say, just share the live. Share the live and give us this thumbs up. Share the live, give us the thumbs up, show your appreciation, and we're going to get started in a short while. You know, we always say uh, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we must rejoice and be glad in it. We must give thanks and praise to being in the land of the living. Many persons will not have been um, this fortunate. And we continue to tell you every morning that you wake and see a new day, you ought to give praise and thanks to the Almighty for allowing you this privilege to be here for another day and to allow you this privilege to be with us in this classroom as we bring you information on what, all that is going on. The important thing, the credible information. And I think by now, given the responses we have had, we know that people appreciate what we're doing and that the information is indeed credible. I know we continue to say if we see anything on this program and the people want to challenge, you're free to do so, you know. But so far, there has not been any challenge, and this is over two years, not been any challenge, because we make sure that whatever we say is credible. So share the live, share the live, and as we say, when you come on, um, give us a thumbs up, give us, show us some appreciation, show us um, some love. And uh, as I said, hope you enjoy this long weekend that we're coming off of in Guyana, notwithstanding all the blackouts, which we got to touch on uh, briefly as we go on. All the blackouts in this land that is supposed to be one of the fastest growing economies uh, in the world. It just means that the authorities don't have a clue as to what is going on. They're not addressing critical um, issues. They're not doing that. So we still have a lot of blackout. Um, somebody said for today alone, there were two um, already. Almost every day. Almost every day. So I know as you look on this program, we hope that you're not um, blocked out and therefore you have to be off. But even if that's the case, we are going to continue. We have had that challenge before and we have overcome it. And we, I remind you, that the programs are, are on YouTube and on Facebook, the page. So even if you miss the live, or if you want to go back over what was said, go to YouTube. The program there, you just type in um, Speaking Out, Exposing Corruption and Incompetence. You're going to get all the episodes that we have had. They are there, so you can look at them at, in your own time. And um, I say youtube go to youtube those of you who have not done so yet i know many of you have not done so subscribe to the channel go to facebook like the page and you're going to get notifications whenever the, uh, something is posted on the program so yes yes share the live share the live let people know that we're here and when we say people we're waiting for those two who have been instructed to record the program you know some people at a particular ministry have been instructed to record the program and bring issues to the attention of the um, people in charge. Notice, so we're going to give you the opportunity to come to and to share life. And you too can go on YouTube 
and um, look at the program, you can do so. Now, let, let me say this. As I've said before, we have a lot to tell you um, this morning, a lot. And we are going to do so in a short while. So again, hope you had a wonderful um, Easter weekend. And um, we weren't here to fly kite with you on Easter Monday, but we are going to do all the catching up we can. I'm not sure that we can catch up this week because tomorrow morning at 10, I have court. And then Friday, there's, uh, we have other, I have another engagement on Friday. So maybe i let you know at the end of the program when the next um, when we go have the next episode of Speaking Out. And again, popularity, this program is becoming so popular. So I want to encourage you. It has been because of your um, responses and the fact that you have shared, the fact that you are here on the live, and every time you go and you hit that thumbs up, if you give us a thumbs up, that assists in um, popularizing the program because the algorithms on YouTube and Facebook are going to kick in and more people are going to get the opportunity to see the program. So let me do the roll call. And immediately following the roll call, I will go into the program. I know uh, many of you would have been distract would be distracted this morning, like I am, watching the cricket um, with Sonel Narayan uh, beating bowling. So many of you would be distracted. I am a little distracted, but I will try to make sure that it is not, does not affect the program. Now, we schedule the program a little later than usual this morning, you know, the early thing. And some of the students were anxious. They wanted to know, they were um, messaging me to find out if we were still on. Yes, we are on. And whenever we are not on, we're going to let you know that we're not going to be on. So when we got on this morning, just after 9 o'clock, which I said is uh, much later than usual, the first person who was on was all the way from the UK. Wayne came first followed by Floyd, then we had Barbara and Clay, then we have Malvok, five, came in. Emerson, uh, Emerson said that he is a cold and wet mid-tongue Manhattan. And then from the UK, Lynette came in from the UK. Clay came in. Um, Kenneth, Kenneth is from Maryland. He is very much here. Queenie from um, Brooklyn is in the house. Sandra came in after Queenie. And then we have Keith, Mori. Uh, he said, uh, everyone, you hope everyone had a, a wonderful weekend. Then my squad mate, Carlton, was here. Vibart came in uh, at 9.21 this morning, followed by Karen, followed by Clive from out of the UK, uh, my squad mate from Arizona, 9414 Hartman is here, followed by Debbie. Um, Debbie from Providence on the East Bank of Demerara. Then we have my red mom friend, Raul, is here, followed by Marlin, followed by the one and only 12863, Rohan Jahawar, is in the house. Tilula came next, followed by Jaco from Georgia, followed by Earl. Earl came in and he's speaking about the lawlessness in the Guyana police force. We're going to address that in a short while, Earl. Then Gordon came. And he's from the East Bank. Another East Bank force is here. John Cummins is in the house, followed by Rhonda is here, followed by Brian. And then the next hall is immediately after Brian, Courtney. Then Orin from the UK. We, UK is well represented. You, Orin is from the UK. And then we have uh, Trevor is in the house. Another UK man, um, Winston, came in next, followed by Fergus. And followed by uh, Brian. This is another Brian Barnard this time. We had Brian Saul first. Now we have Brian Barnard. Followed by uh, Doreen from Canada is in the house. Joan. Then we have our friend Jakey. Then after Jakey, we had uh, Winston. Winston is from California. Then the one and only BX from New Jersey is here. Lucius is very much here. Calder, George from BV is here. Troy, Tessa from Florida is present. Paul from Canada. Paul, my old uh, shooting captain, Paul Archer, is here. Pamela uh, is representing the, the west side. Then Grace, followed by Bonita, West Coast Barbies lady is here. Aileen, welcome Aileen. Um, then we have Patricia 
but you should know some New Jersey. Then Sean, the indomitable Sean, he is from uh, Manhattan. Uh, then we have my squad mate, 9555 Stevens, followed by Wayne, followed by John, John Knights. And then Ether is here. Danny, welcome, Danny, welcome. Then we have the man from the East Bank, Vibort. See, we have a wide representation, geographical representation. Then Pauline, Ulrich from Crane is in the house. I know Ulrich will be watching the cricket. And um, uh, he, he spent between the cricket and the program. Then we have, we have Bort. is very much here. Um, he says he's waiting for a pack session. He won't disappoint you, I'm sure. Then from the California game, TK, Dynamo 35, Terence is here. All the way from up the hills in Linden, Ballard is in the house. Carville followed next. Then Francis Keith. Francis Keith from Melanie Damashana. Melville is here. And then after Melville, then we have John Rogers. He says, he Rastaman came next. Followed by Maureen. Then Cranston. Ronald. Leon. Ezzy. Denise. Nigel, Mandela, Anne, Felicia, uh, Morton, Michael Brower, all the way from the um, islands. Uh, Michael is here. Princess from Lamar Springs. Cecile. Then after that, we have Desiree, Colin, followed by the next Colin, Colin Stanford. It was Colin Ari Force, followed by Colin Stanford. Des Denise is very much here. May is here. Sharon, followed by the next man from the East Bank, Anthony Bradshaw, followed by Claude, Boxtonian Claude Thomas, Melissa, Family Music, David, Shamlin, Marcia, Roderick, then Charles, he says he's 13691, ex-sergeant, retired sergeant reporting for duty. Then Denise is here. Um, then we have Evan Lina came next. Then after Evan Lina, we had Lynette. And then those were the people early born in the schoolyard um, on YouTube. And then when we went live on first person on Facebook, we had Edward, then we had Raul, then we had Karen and um, Carlton, um, Lynette from Barbados, and the list is Joan, and the list goes on and on and on. So again, I say, uh, welcome, and you know, roll call is important because roll call let us know the attendance, and roll call serves the purpose of, of letting you know that when we tell you we have these dozens and dozens scores of people um, waiting in the schoolyard even before the, 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 it starts, then you know the evidence is there. It's evidence based. It's evidence based. Now let me make some announcements, and then I'm going to bring in uh, Mr. Conway. You know, unfortunately, uh, we always have to. I'm talking about that before I go on. I see one of our regulars. I don't give her the recognition that she deserves. Adi McCray um, is here. Look, look, let me put it up, Adi. Adi is here in the house. She's always, always here. Um, w259. Um, Adi Prophet McCray. She's watching from Brooklyn, New York. And uh, welcome, Adi. Welcome, welcome. And um, we, as I said, let me make some announcements. We usually start with the sad announcements. We did tell you earlier, some weeks ago, about the death of Wyatt Amsterdam, 9645, ex-policeman. And just to remind you that the funeral service is going to be on Saturday. This Saturday, coming 6th of April, Belgium, West Coast, uh, Bobbies. They are, he died in the U.S. There was a service in the U.S., so he's going to be interned in a, in, at Belgium, his own village in Belgium. West Coast Bobby's on Saturday. And, um, you know, sadly too, last Wednesday after we finished, we learned of the death of um, the female GDF sergeant. They were on a 30 mile walk on the Linden Suzaik Highway and a truck crashed into her and others. And she was killed while on this walk on the highway again. Almost every, well, not almost, every week, you have these um, fatal accidents. And the question is asked if, uh, as I know it, when they have these walks, there are lots of security measures. People with flash, uh, flashing lights, reflectors, um, vehicle to the front, vehicle to the rear. So I don't know what happened. We haven't gotten any, I have not gotten any details as so this took place. But sadly, this female sergeant 
Deslin Nicholson last lost her life um, last um, Wednesday on the Linden Suzdai Highway. And then news came to hand of the death of former um, Chancellor uh, Ms. Desri Bernard. Um, she has a lot of force, and I just want to tell you of some of those as I was reading. They said that she was the first female judge in the high court in Guyana. Then she was the first female um, judge in the appeal court in Guyana. The first female chief justice, the first female chancellor, and the first female judge on the Caribbean Court of Justice. So she had lots of force. She passed away recently at the age of 84. And then coming shortly thereafter, we learned of the death of the first president of the Caribbean Court of Justice. He died on Saturday, I think it was, um, at, at the age 86. And Michael de la Bastide, I learned of it last night and I checked that he died um, over the weekend. I think he lived in Trinidad, so he died. So you had um, Madame Desri Bonard, first female in the Caribbean Court of Justice. And then another Caribbean Court of Justice, uh, former member, Ms. Um, Justice Michael de la Bastide. And only recently, remember a few months ago, we had the death of another um, Caribbean, re recently retired, uh, jurist and the Caribbean court. So three persons who were associated with that court has died in the past couple of months. And also we have, I was announced, many of you might not know um, this lady, Margaret Payer, known as Maggie Payer. She was the operations manager at um, GCIS. I knew Maggie for a number of years, very pleasant uh, person. Every time I went there to renew my insurance, I will seek to see if she's there and say hello to her and so on. But the thing about Maggie that you may not know, Maggie um, had a daughter who died recently, and Colonel Saud, Michael Saud, who died in that helicopter crash, was her son. And people have said that death caused Maggie to grieve so much that she passed away recently. I think tomorrow is her cremation. So Maggie... Um, was known to me. I, I got to know Maggie when I was in yeah, traffic because, you know, traffic chief, you interacted with these people from the insurance agencies to see how best they can assist with certain aspects of the traffic situation. So I got to know Maggie then, and that relationship um, was maintained um, through the years. I missed her on a few occasions recently when I had cost a visit to GCIS, but I learned yesterday that uh, Maggie passed. So I want, and again, as I've said, our son, Michael Saud, was a colonel who died in this helicopter um, crash that we ain't hearing anything about. You no, know, it was announced. And um, up to now, we don't know what is happening to the inquiry uh, and all of that. But the, the initial information that Michael was one of the, Michael wasn't one who was born beyond recognition in the uh, helicopter. It was um, suggested that he might have jumped from the helicopter at some stage and he, he died um, during that fall to the ground or he died in a tree or something like that. So yeah, Maggie is as past and all the others. I want to take this opportunity to express condolences to the relatives, friends of all those persons who we announced uh, 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 this recently deceased. And um, on the happier note, let me just uh, announce some recent birthdays. We have the uh, recent body, belated body, greetings to Assistant Commissioner Pazram. He's the commander of Regional Police Division C. He celebrated the body, I think it might have been yesterday. We also had a recent body of woman, Deputy Superintendent Marna Richards, Aaron. She, I think, is the, uh, when I last I checked, she was the commissioner's secretary, at that function that she had performed for a number of years. So she had a body recently. One of our students, I'm sure you would be on here this morning, had a board day recently. I'm referring to Derek Trotman. Trotty had a board day recently. Also, a former member of the force, retired superintendent, William Welcome. He had a recent board day. And um, one who might not be known to you, but he too is a regular on the program, even though he might not comment. He's always here. I'm talking about McGarvey Attali. McGarvey retired, well, not retired, he resigned from the force, like so many others have done in recent times, 
and I think he has migrated. He celebrated a birthday recently. So I want to wish all those who celebrated their natal day recently all the best and um, Godspeed and hope that you live to see many, many, many more uh, birthdays. I want to also take this opportunity to congratulate Assistant Commissioners McBean and uh, Watts and Deputy Superintendent um, Deputy, uh, Matt, uh, the Deputy Superintendent what, Davison squad mates, they recently um, celebrated their 32nd anniversary in the Guyana Police Force. 32nd anniversary. Uh, Mark Bean, Assistant Commissioner, um, he's at Regional Division 4A, the controversial Errol Watts, who is at Special Branch, and then we had uh, Davidson. You know, you, know, you, you can't, <laughs> some things you can't help but observe. The police decided to congratulate these forces on social media. And you would not believe that the man who is in charge of Special Branch, Errol Watts, his photograph was prominent on social media. They announcing his body. Well, you know, back in the day, there's a no-no. People in the Special Branch, you don't know, um, publicize their photographs and publicize the names. But anything going on is anything. So you are the head of Special Branch plastered on social media. And they said so that he's observing, he celebrated his 32nd anniversary and they get the name and the picture. Oh, oh, guy in the police force. Where are you going? Where are you going? And then I want to congratulate my co-host, um, Mr. Clinton Conway. I know his squad mate, Larson is here, and Larson did indicate that they recently celebrated their 51st anniversary um, from the date when they joined the Guyana Police Force. So those 1,900 policemen, uh, Conway is here, my co-host, and then we also had um, Larson he made the um, comment here. So, um, so congratulations to you guys. Remember only recently, Coach 74, of which I was a member, celebrated our 50th anniversary. Let me bring in Mr. Conway, and then we're going to move on. You see, congratulations to you and your other squad mate. And, and welcome to um, Okay, thank you very much. I'm happy to be in the land of the living and to celebrate 51 years in the Guyana Police Force. Well, I just want to talk a bit about what's McBean and uh, Davison. Because I recruited them in Borbys, where the Borbys College, I think, was course 4B. In those days, you know, I was in charge of the college. When I started the college from, from scratch, I built it. And Larry Lewis had given me the, the, the authority to do my own recruitment. And I remember when I had to interview them for a selection, I checked the night before and I discovered that McBean had the, was the most qualified of, of all, all of them. So I said, I want to see where metal is made of. So I, I left him for last. I said, I sweat out. And then I asked him a couple of questions. And then I asked him, why do why you want to be a member of the Guyana Police Force? And he come with a classical answer. So since I'm a little boy, I, I, I like the police force. And I, I, and I deliberately walk into him, telling me he's dishonest and all kind of thing. And I really, I really, really hustle him at, at, at that in, in interview there. And But he, he stood the test. Today he's in an assistant commissioner. And what's to? After the, for, before the Bobby's training complete the course, they have to come to Georgetown for a four weeks where they do a whole set of issues, including going to the Tim Timmy Rifle Range and, and shoot. And I remember when I brought him down, by then um, Greta McDonald, I think she was a superintendent or there about, she was in charge of recruitment in Georgetown. And she looked at what she said, CC, why you, why you, why you, why you take on this boy in the work? He came to me three times and I'll, I'll three times. I, I tell you too short and I turn it on. Why you take it on? I said, well, I take it on and you can't dismiss it. I said, you get potentials to become a very senior police officer. So he is now an assistant commissioner. And I think she retired as a, as a senior superintendent. But coming back to me too, when, when, I, when I joined the work, I, we had to take measurements. And I think I went at Fort Wellington Police Station. And there was a corporal who was doing the measurements. And so I want to jump on the scale, I had 130 pounds. And the corporal said, no, 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 no. 
you can't join this work with one thirty pounds. One to the five or nothing. You can't hold on no thief man with 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 one one to one twenty pounds. One to the five or nothing. So I say, but sorry, you know, I passed the exam, I get over all ninety-two percent pass. And um, so I got some qualification. The man said, right now, me looking after qualification, neither me, me, me looking after who passed so much percentage you get. I looking after I looking after pounds. One to the five or nothing. There was a, I think it was assistant superintendent there, Gibbs at Fort Benton, and he, he knew me. So he said, I'm by thing you're ready for young Conway. You're going to put on a five pounds, you know? And that's how he reluctantly father processed me. And as fate would have it, he left as an inspector, and I retired as an assistant commissioner. So a lot of things, a lot of strange things has happened in life, Paul. A lot, a lot of strange things. People question your judgment in terms of what? So, so we have all, regards to all the controversies, people say perhaps um, Greta McDonald was correct. She should not have been here in the first place. But I be mean, that as it may, let's say time will tell. But let me move on. You know, yesterday when I, um, um, before I do that, I see one of your squad mates, um, CC 1953 Pantless, is on the um, live and he just made a comment. Say that he's in the house. So welcome and congratulations to you too, 1953 uh, Pantless. Now, as I said yesterday, when I gave the notification for the program, I said that one of the things that we are going to discuss this morning is this recent arrest, well, not arrest, sorry, the detention, shouldn't say arrest, my apologies, the recent detention of Superintendent Mitchell Caesar of the Guyana Police Force, who heads the major crime unit. The story is, let me read what is has been said, and then we're going to go into the details. Um, this is uh, an article that says here, head of the major crime unit of the Guyana Police Force, Superintendent Mitchell Caesar, was reportedly detained and questioned by law enforcement agents recently at the John F. Kennedy Airport in New York. Early on early, earlier on Thursday, that is last Thursday, Director of the Police, Ghana Police Force Corporate Communication Unit, Mark Ramatar, said he could not confirm the report. And the court may have said, What I can confirm is that Mr. Caesar is currently on vocation, on vocation leave in the US. Hours later, Vice President Barrett Jack Dio confirmed to the media that reports that um, what said he did not make any personal inquiries. And Jack Dio is quoted there saying, the report, from, the report from what we gather, the report was made to the superior of that policeman. Then he goes on to say, that will engage the leadership of the police force. That's where the matter will be dealt with, Jack Dio said. After questioning Caesar, after questioning, Caesar was released into the country. Asked whether the government was worried, Jagdeo insisted that the police force would have to further probe the report. And he's quoted there saying, the US will not tell us why they question people. Caesar reportedly traveled to India for training and had just returned to New York on his way to Guyana. That is one, what one news source said. But let me give you the background to that. Um, now they're saying that Caesar was the, um, well, there's no doubt it is confirmed that the Superintendent Mitchell Caesar, the head of the major crime unit in the Ghana Police Force, was detained by the authorities in the US at JFK airport on question. The reports are that he was questioned for an extended period of time and then allowed to um, travel from New York to Miami. And we're gonna go into this. We're gonna go into this in detail. But what, what um, the whole story is Caesar and others. Let me read what the the, the article have said. Caesar and others. If you recall, this is on the January the thirtieth this year. Kaicho News was reporting um, under the caption: "Thirty police officers to undergo training in India on forensic investigations." The article said that the government is placing significant investment into building its forensic capabilities to enhance the administration of justice. 
As part of this effort, some 30 officers on the Guyana Police Force and five officers on the Ministry of Human Services and Social Security will soon travel to India to on a fully paid scholarship to receive training in forensic interviews, is what the article said. This was announced by Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs, Mohamed Anlin Landelad SC, at the opening ceremony for the two-day restorative justice training at the Ghana Police Force Officers Mess Al Evlery Georgetown on Monday. And the court Nandalala saying we are investing in these programs on policies right across the divide. You can attest to the dozens of police and prison officers and social workers who are being sent on training across the globe so they can return here and impart this knowledge to others in the discharge of their function. We have recognized that we have to change our approach to investigations if we are to be successful, the Attorney General stated. He highlighted that with the advent of more innovative and intricate advancement in technology, criminals are exploring creative ways to commit infractions. And as such, the state apparatus must be versed in new areas to curb these um, acts. And he goes on to say something more. But the, the thing is, Caesar and others traveled from Guyana to India to take part in this training program. When the program ended, Caesar traveled on his way to back to Guyana. He traveled to J. John F. Kennedy Airport in New York. And he was detained by the US authorities and questioned. As I've indicated before, they said that he was questioned at length. Some reports suggested seven to eight hours, which is long, intense uh, questioning. After the questioning, he was allowed to proceed to Miami, where apparently he um, was spending some um, time, some vacation before he returned to Ghana. We don't know if he returned to Ghana yet, because this is only um, last week. This is only, uh, I think, Thursday, Friday, around Wednesday, Thursday, all of this happened. So we don't know if he's still in Miami. Uh, we don't know if he has returned to Guyana. But let me say this. Can you imagine the senior member, one of the most senior members in the Criminal Investigations Department of the Guyana Police Force, Guyana Police Force, the head of the major crimes unit, is detained by the U.S. authorities and questioned for an extended period of time. And the vice president is saying that there is not a matter for the government, there is a matter for the administration of the Ghana police force. Can you imagine that? A senior officer detained and questioned and, and um, Jagdio is a, well, there is not a matter for the government. There is a matter for the police I command to deal with. Can you imagine the statement that the vice president who represents the government because he speaks about government issues uh, more than anyone else. Every Thursday at least he's there on his uh, what they call a press conference. I know press conference. He's there and he, he spouts a lot of, I can't describe it here, and this is not that program. But he says a lot of things. And he is saying, this is the last Thursday, he's saying that the fact that the head of the major crimes unit of the Guyana Police Force was detained by the federal authorities in the U.S. is not a matter for the government of Guyana. The police I command, the police hierarchy will have to deal with that. And, um, then the, I wonder what he was questioned about because, you know, um, the U.S. authorities are not going to randomly just um, pull him in and question. They would have asked specific and direct questions related to specific direct issues and incidents and all of that. So, yes, Mr. Vice President, the U.S. authorities will not tell you what they um, question him about, but I'm sure, I'm sure that you and other government functionaries, the hierarchy of the police force will be interesting to know what did the federal authorities question Mr. Caesar about? Any responsible um, person, any responsible government, any responsible police force would want to know that what was he questioned about? And you are just um, brushing it aside, sir. There's not a matter for the government. There's a matter for the police um, to, to, to deal with. And let me say this about Caesar. Can remember, this is not, I don't know what he was questioned about. I don't know what he was questioned about. That has not been revealed. Apparently now, I'm sure the U.S. will not tell you that. It's for Caesar to say, to say what he was questioned about. 
But remember, you had serious allegations not so long ago against Caesar Boscom, Detective Sergeant Dean Boscom, said that the major crime unit headed by Caesar, he called Caesar name, said that they took $30 million from Azudin Muhammad to cover up the paper shards murder. And to remind you, paper shards was killed um, in front of Palm Court. In, 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 um, in March of 2021, he was riddled with uh, bullets from um, what appeared to be an AK-47 and pistol and, and the 90 mm um, cases were found at the scene. Palm Court in Main Street, a stone's throw from where the present official resident is. That matter remains unsolved. All the cameras that suddenly couldn't work. So that allegation was made. I know um, Caesar threatened to sue um, Bascom. I know Mohammed sued Bascom. The matter was in court up to recently, something last week. Um, I can't recall whether Caesar had proceeded with the lawsuit, but he did send a lawyer's letter to Bascom. So that was an allegation made against Caesar as well. I don't know, was it that they wanted to question him about? Um, because, you know, as I've said, that matter, paper shards, murder, remains unsolved. And let, let me tell you of, of another um, matter involving the same major crime unit. Many of you might not remember, so I am here as the research man to, to remind you, to refresh you. Now, let me tell you this. I'm going to read a part. This story goes like this. This is on the Kaicho News on August 9, 2018. It says, Sabrineville shooting. Pandemonium broke out. A pandemonium breaks out after businessman gets $1.5 million bail. Pandemonium broke out yes, um, yesterday afternoon in the Georgia Marshall Court around Kampong after city magistrate granted Irving Bacchus, the businessman who is accused of shooting a man several times in the back, $1.5 million bail on a manslaughter charge. The dead man's relatives, upon hearing that the accused was granted bail, hurried out of the, um, the courtroom and began shouting, we need justice. The wife of the deceased, who was crying uncontrollably, stating, what will happen to my two sons now? An innocent man get killed and the accused is walking free. 45-year-old Bacchus, the owner of Torres Villa Hotel, at 265th Street Avenue, Provine Will Kitty appeared before a magistrate where the manslaughter charge was read to him. And let me read, an, well, let me let me tell you what, the, the, another thing, I'm going to bring you Mr. Conway a while, I want to give you the background to this thing. Then it says here, this is um, on October the 6th, 2018, and this is some Guyana standard. Senior cop allegedly helped Sobrineville Hotelier swap surveillance DVR after neighbor's murder. So remember, this man got killed. What, what's, I can't, what's his name? I can tell you the whole thing. The Florimont, Jason the Florimont, killed allegedly by um, Bacchus, charged with manslaughter. He was charged with manslaughter. And then they're saying here on the 6th of October, this report is saying, a senior member of the Guyana Police Force allegedly helped Sobrineville Georgia Hotel owner Irving Bacchus to cover his tracks after he allegedly pumped three bullets into his neighbor, into his neighbor, killing him on the spot. This damning allegation comes just two months after 30-year-old Jason DeFormont was murdered inside the businessman's La 265th uh, Avenue Sobrineville property. The Torres Villa owner the Torres Villa Hotel owner was previously charged with manslaughter, but had his charge upgraded to murder after the director of public prosecution was asked to re-examine the file. According to the information received, on the morning of August 4th last, when the format was killed, the businessman reportedly had someone erase the footage that was recorded on the Sobrianville camera. In addition to this, there are reports that when the technicians from the Ghana police force examined the businessman's camera on the digital video recorded the DVR, the device that stored the data from the CCT camera, the two were not compatible. And the quoting associate saying, this, this means that the DVR was swapped after the shooting. The businessman 
Add high definition camera and the DVR we found could not have worked with those cameras. Also, the DVR was brand new, a source close to the investigation said. The source added that at the time of the shooting, a senior member of the force was inside the hotel with a female. It was the cop who reportedly guided the businessman to tampering with the evidence. After the shooting, the same policeman called another policeman and the two of them start to in start the investigation right away. And that's how the man gets charged with manslaughter in the first place, the source said. He revealed that those two policemen were transferred from the criminal investigation department at least two months prior. And one was demoted to uniform after they were suspected to have tampered with evidence in another case. The Guyana Standard was told that while Bacchus' charge was upgraded to murder, some ranks are worried that he might walk free based on how the investigation was done and the file was structured. And the court here again is saying, if justice is to be served, then the case has to be reinvestigated. There are a lot of missing evidence from the file and the misplaced surveillance DVR is a major part of the investigation, but that was omitted from the case. That is what I'm saying. That is what the, the major crime, they accused the major crime unit headed by Caesar of tampering with the evidence in this Sobrianville murder where this man, Bacchus, um, was, was uh, charged. For manslaughter, mind you, he was charged for manslaughter. And then later on, it was upgraded. It was upgraded. The charge was upgraded to murder. And he was remanded in custody. And, you know, I do the follow-up. I do the investigation to bring to your attention. He died recently, you know. He died. This man, Bacchus, Orville Bacchus, I am advised that he died recently while on remand in the Georgetown prison. And my information is he did not die in the prison. My information suggests that long before he died, he came out of prison. Don't know the circumstances, came out of prison and he died. He died. So and he go and, and as the report said, remember in um on the when Mr. Leslie James was commissioner of police, Caesar and others were removed from the CID during the Leslie James. They were returned to CID after the government returned, after the PPPC government returned to power in, on August the 2nd, 2020. Blanham, the crime, now crime chief, he was removed. He was returned. Caesar was removed from the CID. He was returned. Um, Nigel Stevens was removed. He too was returned. And I, rec I recall um, Landry, I think he's a sergeant, they, you know, they, they were all removed by James. And perhaps James might want to tell the Guyanese public why they were removed. And perhaps the new administration would want to tell us why they were then taken back to the CID, where all of these allegations, because remember the allegations with paper shot is after. After. The one with Bacchus was before. But these allegations were there. Right. And let me say this. Despite the nonchalant remarks by the vice president, oh, this is not for we, this is for the um, police hierarchy to deal with. I am sure, right, that he and others are very, very worried, as they well should be, because Caesar, in this position, as the Americans will so say, know where the bodies are buried. They, get, they know a lot of story. And they cannot feel comfortable that Caesar was questioned by the feds for a lengthy period of time. They must, they, as the guys will say, the body must be biting. Because they don't know what he told them. And the fact, let me say this too, the fact that he was released from custody and made to continue traveling 18 within the U.S., meaning a takeaway visa, that is even more cause of concern because you won't know what bargain would have been struck, what deal um, he, he would have made because the likes of Caesar, buddy, is going to save themselves. As you know, they'll tell you, save yourself and let your brother go astray. Save yourself and let your brother go astray. The man know a lot of story about senior police officers. He know a lot of story about senior government functionaries. And if the feds had him there for... Um, any length of time, as I've said, it must be a, it must be targeted questioning. 
the feds is not like these people we get in Guyana asking us at a stupid question. They will be targeted, questioning about specific incidents, about specific things. They would have questioned him about. And I say again, the fact that he was allowed to continue to travel and might still be in the U.S. should be cause for concern of all of those people, like the vice president, who nonchalantly say, oh, there's not a matter for the government, there's a matter for the police hierarchy to deal with. Did they seize his phone as they did with me, Thomas the Pierce? Did they take his phone to mine all the information on, the, on that or those instruments? Did they do that? Yeah, I might want to ask him um, if they took his phone from, from him. Because let me tell you this, if they took his phone, they're going to be able to recover all the information. If you believe he raised and he, do, he got to recover all the information. I know of that technology. I know of that technology. I was part of that operation, not for the force, but not an institution. So I know of that technology that can bring back everything that you believe that you deleted from the um, phone. And then, um, again, I say, why was his visa not revoked? Is it that a deal was cut? I want to say to all of those people now that, again, I say, you are going to be worried. You have to be worried. And even when, if and when Caesar returns, you are going to be uncomfortable. I know you're going to question him. He's going to tell you all what he wants you to know. And he's not going to tell you everything. And I guess you're going to be afraid when you are in his presence. And further, I say not. Let me bring in Mr. Conway to have his say on this. You see, the head of the major crime unit of the Ghana Police Force is detained at JFK by the U.S. authorities, questioned for a prolonged period of time. And the vice president is telling us, oh, there's not a matter for the government, there's a matter for the police command to deal with. What are your views, my brother? And, and that'll be of major concern, you know, not only to, to the Ghana police force, but, but but the government. And when you look at it, you know, there are similar facts. You you mentioned about the, the Bacchus story, and then we had the, the, the paper shots. Rembo Bascom made damning allegations, and instead of they, they, instead of they, they, they listened to him, they rushed with breakneck speed to debunk his story. And they did a horrible job attacking by the, the extended squatter and the head of, 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 the, of, the, of, the, of the CID. And they tried to discredit him. Well, a major thing they say that he lived in, in a house rent free in a secrible, which is owned by a businessman. So the, he's compromised. And then shortly after, this Ghana police force received 10 vehicles from the same businessman. <laughs> so if Caesar was compromised, it means the said Ghana police force was also com com compromised. <laughs> and we, 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 we got to be concerned. Because the U.S. don't just pull you in just like that. They wait until they, they build a case against you. And if you watch... All them drug people are police for drug trafficking. None, none never never get quitted. All get convicted. They'll have the information there. And Paul, you a board man, perhaps, perhaps you might know, perhaps um Caesar. Maybe, maybe whistle like a canary or or, or whistle like a toe, toe. You know, the thing is 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 frightening, and they gotta be of concern because. They won't tell it. They won't tell the police force or the government what they discuss with Caesar. That that's not, not not their policy. But Caesar will talk, and Caesar Caesar would want to ensure hey, that you know to each his own. He want to ensure that hey, me 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 bearing chair for nobody. Like sir, why you want for sir? And he had to be. He had to whistle to their tune, make that is that they have to that they allow him to remain in the states. And they didn't cancel his, his visa, like how they cancel the, the, the former um, PS Home Affairs visa. So, lots of things with the major crime unit. And, and as you mentioned, they were all transferred out of the CID. And with the change of government, they all, including the head of the, head of the CID, returned to CID. 
return to handle the 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 the, 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 the crime unit. So it is it is you know cause for concern, and I sure many government officials they they they, they are uneasy. And not only government officials, many members of the Ghana police force, including senior persons, one who said one who the Alessandro uh, USA, if they make him a deputy commissioner or, or commissioner, they're gonna cancel his visa, like how they the cancel green visa because of his association with certain members of the business community who the UN United States States of interest in. So um, let, let, let's wait and see what, what, what's, what's going to happen, Paul. Yeah, let's wait and see. And I, I know that we want, we not have to wait too long. But I said, the man, here, let me say this again. You said the man might have sung, sung like a tower tower. One of my favorite boys when I used to mind board, tower tower, tower beautiful singing. Some of you call him bastard, whatever you want to call it. But the old story is, the old story is, if, as we now know, Caesar was detained by the feds at, um, in JFK. I understand now only one federal agent, federal agency. He might have been more than one federal agencies questioning him, him. My information suggests that one of those agencies might have been um, the DEA, the Drug, Drug Enforcement Authority. I don't know. Cardi, I'm telling you. And CC, you said something that the U.S. would not tell you what they were questioning about. Is Caesar have to tell you? But let me tell you this. Caesar can be asked to, to, to explain what he was questioning about. But I sure saw the things he got lock off. Some things he's not going to um, make clear. I you know we don't have polygraph in Guyana. It would have been a good thing when you put them, when you question him, you put him on a polygraph or a light detector test to see when he's dancing and when he's squirming. He's going to say, what he has been programmed to say. And despite, I say again, despite this cavalier or nonchalant attitude by the vice president last Thursday at his press conference, I'm going to put in quotes, press conference. I know, I know a lot of people worried. A lot of people worried, including some of those persons who, um, his name was Colin by Boscom about allegations of corruption. And so they got to be worried. They gotta be worried. If they're not worried, I challenge them to jump on a plane and say you're going to Miami if you have a visa. Jump on a plane to go to the US on vacation at this time. Jump on a plane if you're not afraid. Or if you go to Trinidad or somewhere, you can't remember there's the rendition. Remember rendition? Remember the concept of rendition? Where Roger Khan was arrested in Suriname and the Surinamese extradited him to Guyana via Trinidad. And when the plane touched down in um, Trinidad, the feds were there to pick him up and take him to the United States. Now for them got to be afraid to travel, not only out of Ghana, but even to the border locations. Because, you know, you might end up, you left to say, you believe you land at Letham, and you land across in Brazil, and you get in a free flight to um, the U.S. with free orange suit and all of that. You're well um, dressed up, you're well decorated. So, as again I say, Despite the fact that they're telling you that, no, no, no. And don't ever forget, don't ever forget this man who was um, arrested. Uh, what, what's his name? Yeah, let me out this student, the man who, um, they're in U.S. custody. Well, the custody, because I think he got um, ankle bracelet and he might be moving around within certain places, who went to the States and he was picked up and questioned. Uh, I can't remember his name now. Somebody can remind me uh, just now who his name. The man from, I think, was crossed the river a few months ago. He went to the States and people said he was singing that he went there to cut a deal because he was a U.S. citizen and um, his passport expired. And Dataram, thank you very much, student. Dataram, Barry Dataram. Barry Dataram. Remember Barry Dataram? You see, these things all have links. We might not recognize it. We might not recognize it. But Dr. Ram was there, or is there, he would have been questioned at length. I am sure that he would have given up quite a lot. The had the PS passing through other um, phone seized. That would have been mined for information. 
So all of these things are adding up now. All of these things are adding up. Perhaps the chickens are coming home to roost. So, Mr. Vice President, you could convey the impression that you and others should not be concerned. I know different. And other people know different. That you all have every reason to be concerned, especially to in light of the recent questioning by the United Nations Nation Human Rights uh, Body. All of these things, all of these things, have, in, in my view, all of these things have some kind of link. All of these things have some kind of link. And yet, till you know, when I look in my crystal ball, I can see in the first instance, people squirming. People in Guyana right now, senior police officers, um, senior government functionaries, the fact that Caesar was um, detained, they are tremendously worried. They're going to give you the impression outwardly, oh, there's no need for concern, uh, as the impression the vice president tried to give. No need to concern. But I know that they are concerned. Barry Dataram in the U.S., he went there most likely to strike a deal. May Thomas Toussaint, the PS Home Affairs, detained and questioned, or phone seized, or visa revoked. Now the head of the major crime unit in the Guyana police force. Major crime. And again, I got to emphasize, for all intent is what? The, the, perhaps the, most second, the second most senior man in the CID. Now you have the crime chief, who is an assistant commissioner. You have he, who is the head of the major crime as a superintendent. There might be other people with the same rank. But in terms of responsibility, in terms of um, the role, he is um, seen to be perhaps the, most, the second most senior man in the um, CID. And this man is detained, I got to emphasize, and questioned and allowed, to and allowed to remain in the US. You know, again, this is significant. The man is allowed to remain in the US, which is, in my experience, which is unusual. Because once they do that, you would have been either sent back or they would have taken away the visa. So no, they did not do that. He's allowed to remain. Wonder what was the deal? What was the deal? And I say again, a man like Caesar can save himself and let his brothers go astray. There's something we used to say in the country. Save yourself and let your brother go, go astray. So whatever information the feds wanted, he might have provided or might have promised to provide in the future. He might have promised to provide in the future. So appear to be um, nonchalant, appear to be not to be worried about it. That's for those who don't know. But I am telling you students here now, here and now, they have every, 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 every reason, every reason to be concerned. And I know that they are concerned. I know that they are concerned, but they're going to give the impression that, look, oh, we are not concerned. They're going to give the impression that we are not concerned. But I know they are concerned because we will wait to see who next will be pulled in. We'll wait to see, according to Critic, a whole set of people visa get pulled. Critic said so. That is Critic. He said a whole set of people visa get pulled. And I, I say, I say, Inter Beniba. Make Kwashiba take notice. The younger folks might not understand that parable, but it's a parable that Bonham used to use quite a lot. The late, great Lyndon Forbes Sanson Bonham. Inter Beniba, make Kwashiba take notice. Right? So I show it again. The first get a name on a list there. The first get a name on a list, just waiting for the right time. And I say, this is not guy in a police force or CID who picking up people randomly. They're picking up people, um, like in the case of the Rosal murder, you pick up a whole set of people, have them there for a few days, then you lose them. You pick them up back again, and you lose them. And up to now, you can solve this crime. The paper shots murder in 2018. Um, even the RAS said, oh, they can deal with it. And up to now, you can't make any um, headway. At least you're not telling the public of that. Even when recently, recently the critic said, Critic on his um, program called, said the Bahamas were had something to do with paper shot murder. And I'm not aware, at least you have not said whether you questioned critic, whether critic was made to give a statement. You claim that this matter is an uh, open investigation. Hanama goes on social media and makes allegation 
against this businessman whose name had been called in this matter before. And I am not aware that you are taking any um, statement from me. I'm not aware. You have not said so. Perhaps you did. But that should have been in my teaching and training as a police officer, right? From the time he made a statement, from the time he come out of the program, the police should have been there asking them to provide a statement um, to them about this allegation he just made on social media. Should have been there asking them to provide a statement and you take it from there. But all them things happen. I am saying the feds don't operate that way. When the feds decide to come and question you, they would have done all the background work and they're coming to ask pointed questions, pointed questions about specific incidents and issues. So appear to be um, not to be worried. Fool those who are your sycophants and who can be easily fooled. People like me and my students here are not going to be fooled that easily. So, so Conway, any, any word on this, any final word on this before we move on? It's amazing and amazing, and it should be a major concern, you know, where Caesar, the head of the serious crime unit, who for us may be the number two man in the in the CID, detained for hours and then released, spending time in the USA. It's it's it's, it's, it's a significant something, and. Maybe because he whistled, they allow him to stay there. Or sometimes, not only that, perhaps he, he was given certain instructions that when he comes to there, you know, X, Y, or Z, you know, or, 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 or remain a sleeper until being activated. So, so many different things. You know, those in the security field who know what, 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 what I'm talking about, that he, I won't be surprised. If you're given certain instructions when he's back in there and what to do and what not to do. Well, let's move on. Oh. Let, let me move on. It's not me, not me to worry. We just bring information to the uh, student. We, it's not me to, to, to be worried. It's, it's them. Them who get things for why They say you get Congo tear. Though they got to look for rain. Those who get. Uh, today is a day of parables, man. Do, you get Congo tear. Though they got to look. Uh, for rain. You got to keep looking for rain if you get Congo T uh, outside. So that is what the story with um, Caesar and we will continue to monitor to see um, to hear when he goes back and to hear and to see what happens. But I can tell you shots have been fired. That is just um, shots fired across the bow. Let's wait and see the fallout. Let's wait and see the fallout. Who more and get pick up and pull in and all of that. Now, let, let me say, let me move on. As he said, let me move on. I saw um, recently, April 1, article police force to be renamed. That is what Minister Ben is quoted as saying. Police force to be renamed. And the thing is on April 1. So I have to say, that got to be an all fool's day joke. <laughs> I said I gotta be an All Fools Day joke. You know, April Fool. I say we can gotta say All Fools Day, April the fourth. Police force is to be remained. And hear what the thing say. I'm gonna read it. I'm gonna read it in keeping with the organization plans for the Ghana security sector. A comprehensive reform is currently on the way, starting with the renaming of the Ghana Police Force. Minister of Affairs Robson Ben, while addressing the recent regional security system. Council of Ministers meeting disclosed that the Guyana Police Force will soon be known as the Guyana Police Service. The name change aims to portray a better image of the organization and government members said it will benefit all Guyanese and according to Minister Ben, work is being done to ensure there is a smooth transition. <laughs> Look, I'll tell you, uh, Fool's Day joke, April Fool's Day joke. We are, that is, ben is quoted there saying, we are looking at reforming the Ghana police force into police service. Our commissioner and staff have been diligently working on establishing a police academy, complete with buildings and training facilities, Minister Ben remarked. He reaffirmed Ghana's commitment to becoming a leader and a significant resource for the Caribbean within the RSS framework 
RSS supposed to be the regional security system. But as we have said, they left out a major worry. They left out the A. Um, he addressed the need for improved leadership, particularly the middle level, highlighting the importance of training, integrity, and professionalism within the force. Ben also discussed the potential benefits of exchanging personnel with other jurisdictions to enhance knowledge sharing and training methodologies. As such, he also underscored the importance of identifying strengths and weaknesses to facilitate targeted improvements and emphasized the significance of continuous training and exemplary leadership to elevate the overall integrity and professionalism of the police service. The Ghana Police Force will soon be known as the Ghana Police Service. The police force is divided into seven police divisions with various branches, each commanded by divisional or branch commander who report to the commissioner of police. The objectives of the force as outlined in the Police Act include the preservation of law and order, the order peace, the repression of internal disturbances, protection of property, apprehension of offenders, enforcement of laws, and the prevention and detection of crime. The article goes on, the, re the recent modernization efforts have, been, have seen the establishment of, of a community relations department to strengthen police community relations, promote safe communities, and enhance preventative policing strategies through positive engagement and a public trust. And then you know the Salawala. Let me go read the Salawala part for y'all. This year, 30.3 billion has been allocated to the Ghana Police Force. Of this sum, 1 billion has been approved to acquire additional vehicles, motorcycles, both, and engine to boost uh, response capabilities of the Ghana Police Force. And 5 million, 5 billion for the rehabilitation of police stations. Additionally, 300 body cameras will be produced, will be procured for police ranks. This investment has led to the advancement of works in various key areas, including command centers, criminal investigation department, and living quarters of police personnel in several regions. Also, construction of a state-of-the-art 12-story breakdown police station with a budget of 5.4 billion is currently underway. Are there peace more the at the BS we're talking about. In, 2000, in 2013, the AP and AFC government voted against the second reading of a bill intended to change the name of the Ghana Police Force to the Ghana Police Service. No one from the, AP, from the AP and U opposition spoke on the police change of name bill 2013, and the People's Progressive Party government lost the vote by 27 to 29 when the votes were tallied. The name change was long proposed, proposed with successive police reform recommendation over the years. That is the article. Now, I get a lot to say on it. But before I comment, let me bring in Mr. Conway to tell me or to tell us what he thinks about this um, police force to remain. And significantly, as I've said, this announcement came on April 1, All Fool's Day. And I think it's an All Fool's Day joke. Mr. Conway, what are your views about this proposed reform um, change? It, it sounds like an All Fool's Day joke, but it is no joke, you know. And you, and you don't just overnight just change a name for name's sake and expect that you'll have better performance and increase all kind of efficiency and effectiveness. That if you're going to change the name, you have to go to Parliament. Like they did in 2013, with what you call the Police Change of Name Bill 2013, Bill number 14 of 2023. And I have a a copy of the bill, you know, and the explanation memorandum said the bill seeks to change the name of the Police Act to Police Service Act. It changes the name of the police force to the Police Service and the name of the Police Discipline Act to the Police the Police Services Act. The bill makes similar changes to the Police Complaints Authority Act and in all subsidiary legislation. Accordingly, all laws are to be read and construed in accordance with the changes of name effected by the Act. Yes, and um, they took it to Parliament and it was vitiated. The opposition voted against them. Apparently, like, they didn't have full membership there on, on both sides, and the opposition had the majority there and they vitiated that bill. So maybe Mr. Ben will have to come back with another bill. I think and that bill was a Clement Roy is the man who, who piloted that bill. So if you're going to change the name, it doesn't mean to say that you can 
things would be efficient and effective. I'll talk a little more about that. That change the name sometimes doesn't mean a thing. It is just talk and talk and and and, and still more talk. But the, but the background is the foundation is that for the name to change, you have to go to parliament, you have to pilot the bill, and then you gotta vote for it. Like like what they did with the fire service. Where they change the name for the fire service. So the way they change the name to the fire and a rescue service instead of fire service. Fire and a rescue service. But they have to go to parliament and change it. So that should be the first step. Apparently, the minister is jumping the gun. But we talk about the things that got to come into place if you want a change the name and you want better or more efficient performance. Now, let me say, let me say this. Let, 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 me, let me be clear about this. Changing the name of any organization can't change the organization. <clears throat> Change the name of the Ghana Police Force, the Ghana Police Service cannot change what is going on in the Ghana Police Force. And I speak from a position of authority because I have said when the IDB reform started sometime, it had been, I think, around, um, no, Mr. Felix was the commissioner, around 2005 or sometime then, I was identified by the police I command by the senior officers in the police force and by the government to lead that reform process. I was the person identified. And I worked on that program until um, around uh, 2006, after the election and Rui became the Minister of Affairs, Henry Green, who by then sometime had become the commissioner, told him that he wasn't comfortable that he as a commissioner was leading the um, reform project. There was an article in Kaichon News about it. If you do the research, you will see. And Green started to do it. And from then, and Mr. Connery will tell you, nothing happened with that reform process. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. So they could still be talking about it. But one of the things we recognize that if you to change an organization, and we did that with the IDB because when the IDB come, it's not they just brought something to us. We had days of interaction with police training school at the time. I think Mr. Conway and other senior officers would have been there to identify the weaknesses, um, to identify how we're going to approach the changes that were required, how they are going to be funded. And that, that is how the IDB um, security sector reform program came about, to a, a, a proper process the, 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 um, with the PS and all of us involved in this discussion. And we identified, as we have said, that if you want to change an organization, any organization, not only the police force, you have to look at um, certain things. You have to look at the structure. You have to look at the policies. You have to look at the personnel. In terms of structure, when we talk about structure, we're talking about the ranks, the different ranks. We're talking about how the divisions and the stations are, are, are located. The, 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 um, the command structure in those divisions, all of that. That we got to look at. This release, they're saying that the uh, several reform, uh, what I say, the name change was long proposed within successive police reform recommendation over the years. Yeah, that they also um, recommended that the structure of the force, this hierarchical military structure should be flattened. I remember that very well because as it is now, the Guyana Police Force's structure from constable to commissioner is one of the tallest structures in the world. You get 13 levels from constable right up to commissioner. And that doesn't include um, apprentice. It doesn't include uh, station sergeant, which is a rank in the, in the, in the law. It doesn't include cadet of um, ASPs and probation, which you have so many now. And if you include those, if you include those, you talk about 16 levels. And we had identified that because of those overlapping levels, problems are created because there's no distinction between the role of a lance corporal and a corporal, very little between the role of a, a corporal and a sergeant, and it goes on like that. So the people had recommended that the structure should be flat, uh, flattened and it will aid better communication and all of that. So you're, you're talking about this one aspect. So you have to look 
at the structure of the organization. We talk about changing an organization, you know, not just going to parliament and change the name from force to service and believe, what a shajam, everything is going to fall in place. No, you have to look one at the structure. And when we talk about structure again, rank structure, they how they um, are deployed to serve the communities. Then we're talking about station, we're talking about outposts, we're talking about the patrols. You have to look at that uh, um, carefully. And then you have to look, as I've said, the policies, that, that is critical. We were um, asked to look at the policies or the standing orders or the SOPs, whatever you want to call it. And these vindictive, uh, corrupt people decide when they wanted to get rid of me on Conway for the Police Service Commission. Oh, the fact that we were reviewing it and that we were paid a stipend, that amounted to fraud. So they all us before the court. All us. And the other standing order now, 2002, the latest revision, which speaks about governor, which speaks about steam of fear, which speaks about railway fear, and all sort of outdated languages. They're still there, still there on today like today. And this is not an all fool's day joke. On today like today, those things are still there. You have to look at your policies. You look at your structure, you look at your policies, your operational order, your standing order, your SOPs, you have to look at all of those things. And update those things to make sure that they reflect the current situation. And let me say this. We have said it before. We know that the Guyana Police Force, uh, post-2021, uh, 20, when we were charged, contracted with the University of Guyana to assist in um, revising the standing order. Even though they said that the standing order was revised and there was no need for James to um, employ us in 2020, 2019, to assist with the revision of the standing order. They have contracted, I have a copy of the contract. They have contracted with the University of Ghana to assist in the review and the revi uh, and revising the standing order. And I said before, and I've said, no university. And this is not me, this is not meant to knock the university. But when you talk about the standing order of the police, you have to have police, people with policing experience to assist in that process. And no professor from the university or no professor from no law school can uh, revise or create standing orders, um, appropriate standing orders for the Guyana police force or any police force for that matter. So you have to look at your policies. And then you have to look at your personnel. I made some notes here about the personnel issue. You have to look at the note. You have to look at personnel. And when you look at personnel, what are you looking for? Let me let me. Student, take out, take your notes. Take notes. You have to make sure that they are well trained. That goes without saying. Your personnel have to be well trained. They have to be disciplined. Both as both of those aspects are now lacking in the police force. The training is not there. The discipline is not there. You have to look at for them to be accountable. People have got to be accountable for their actions. Right now, accountability has gone through the window. So things like the Discipline Act that they're talking about, are they exist, even they exist in the breach. People are not disciplined for infraction and, and because of lack of knowledge. The officers and the other people don't know what to do. And then you, you have to look at, at people got to be motivated. You have a, now a demotivated workforce. Someone told me a few days ago that um, from 2020 to current day, you have in excess of 400 members of the Ghana police force. Listen to this carefully. Between 2020 and 2024 to date, over 400 members of the Ghana police force have resigned, walk off the job. In other words, they've gone absent without leave or retired. Over 400. And if you remember, if you remember the recent officers' conference, the acting commissioner, the extended squatter, said so to the public that we have difficulties in attracting and maintaining uh, members of the force. We're just moving on. A man spoke to me uh, last week. After 21 years, he said he couldn't take it any longer. He has moved on. A woman wrote something to me a few weeks ago. Her husband had something like 20 something years service um, as a sergeant and decided to move on. And she said that he regret that he didn't move on before because his, his package where he is now is far um, in excess, far more lucrative than what he earned 
as a sergeant in the police force. You have to get, and, and in Guyana, you have to have a force that is free from political interference. And no one can deny political interference. Dog whistles. Vice President make a statement about being disappointed in Soku, in not um, charging Winston Jordan, the former finance minister, a couple of days after or so, Jordan is arrested and charged. Takumo Gonsi makes a speech on the East Coast and somebody whistle, give a dog whistle, and he is arrested and charged with some sedition or some or thing like that. You have that interference, interference. You are the case, I'd like to uh, remind you, where the now magistrate, Tamika Clark, was addressed, she was a lawyer, arrested by Soku for, address, uh, for advising her client not to give a statement to the police. She was arrested by the police. And the Attorney General, Anil Nanlal, SC, MP, said that he um, instructed them to put her on bail. And then he makes some statement of he being the constitutional advisor or something, some crap like that to the police force. That is interference. He has no authority, no right to have called and instructed for her to go on bail. That those are matters to the police to resolve. Police, I command. But, and, and you know, I said it because at the time when that was reported, the lawyer um, for Ms. Clark called the Attorney General. That is what was reported. He called the Attorney Why did he call the Attorney General? Call the Attorney General because he knows that is where the power there. That is where the power lies. So he called him. So those type of interference you're going to have, um, you, you can't have those things if you're going to, that is where you got to look at to change the organization. And you got to promote people based on merit. People are demotivated because men will tell you, people will tell you, men and women, that they have worked for years diligently and they are not being recognized. And people, because of their political affiliation, are being recognized. You got a man, get three promotions in the police force. Three. Prem Narang. Three promotions. He promoted from constable to corporal, corporal to inspector and from inspector to superintendent. Unprecedented, unordered. Of. This man is not, doesn't have any special qualification apart from his political affiliation. None. Three promotions in the police force. Three to corporal, from constable to corporal. Corporal to inspector. Inspector to superintendent. And you want to tell me that you changing the name can change all of those things? And if you recall, let me tell you too, because I know when we did research, when they had the fiasco at Ashman Building in um, Atfield Street, when it was alleged that people were trying to break in to the um, chairman of the election commission's office, they're trying to break in. Narayan, a police inspector, was one of those persons. At the time, he was stationed at West Demerara. Leonora, I think it was. And he had left to go to court somewhere in town. Found himself at the Ashman Building in the presence of the now president and vice president and those people. And it is alleged that they tried to break in to the chairman office. The man was rewarded and the man is promoted from, from inspector to superintendent, right? And, and as I said, some of these people, some of these people we're talking about, put them for write a proper report or a proper statement. The evidence is they look at the statement when they try to cover up for Dharam Lal on the executable course. Kamraj Sheikh Brand wrote a statement. Even a, Riku, a, a rookie constable would have done better. But the man is a superintendent in charge of a police division. In charge of a police. So people are being promoted based on political affiliation. And that must affect the organization. It will affect the morale of those who are not promoted. And it's going to affect the organization as a whole. The perception, the reputation, of the organization. So the other thing, and then somebody mentioned there I should talk about um, salaries. Somebody said I should talk about salaries. And I don't think I need to mention that here on this program now. I don't think we have sufficient time to go into that, but I'm gonna um, make a, a, a slight reference. In the same, uh, we said people was an assessment. You have to have proper assessment of persons. Do you know? that we have a Guyana police force. The Guyana police force, they do no annual assessment of the ranks, none. Back in the day, 
you have annual confidential reports. So the ranks uh, performance during the course of the year is assessed. And so therefore, when it comes to promotion and those things, a record is there. Those things have not changed in those years now. No, no, years now. But I'm saying that if you are going to talk about reform, if you're going to talk about change, those are the things you have to look at. How are ranks assessed? Part of the problem that you have, and I mentioned it here, is that um, people wait until promotion time to say, oh, this man is no good. You don't perform. Check the person's file. There's nothing in there to reflect that. Nothing. Nothing is there to reflect that. So people are not um, assessed. In, in, when I joined the force, you had ACR, Annual Confidential Report. And based on your report, you were um, set to be entitled to a merit increment. All of those things gone through the window. All of those things have gone through the window and, and the reform process that I was in charge of, we were to look at all of that, all of that. So what I do, you're just spiteful people. All year, the person they're working. When promotion time, they tell you, um, they write to the police office commission of which I was the chairman, that John Jones should not be considered for promotion at this time. Why? When you ask the question why, nobody can give no answer. Or the right to tell you something, he has not been performing. Check the person's file. Nothing like that is reflected in the person's uh, file. Nothing. As a matter of fact, it is even worse than that. Because um, I'm going to call the name, man. I'm going to call the name. Let us sue if they want to sue. Brutus had a pending disciplinary matter before the Police Com uh, Service Commission in 2020 when I was chair. And he wrote to the Police Service Commission in his capacity as admin. And he identified 13 ranks that should not be promoted because they are pending disciplinary matters. I have the ranks name on file. I talk with what him out. But in the same document, he is recommending himself to be promoted. Can you imagine that? The Chief Justice did say that he was self-serving. But I'm telling you, that's the type of thing you have. This man is recommending to the Police Service Commission that ranks by name who have pending disciplinary matters should not be considered for promotion. But he who had a pending disciplinary matter at the same time is recommended uh, for promotion. Those things are wrong. And when you talk about it, people jump up and, and then make a statement about reform and the president making a statement about reform and the vice president spewing nonsense about reform. Reform is not only changing a name. Reform is not only changing a name. It has more to do with that. I've said a lot. Let me bring in Mr. Conway, and then we're going to continue. CC, yeah. let, me, let me hear your views, man. As, as you mentioned, you know, <laughs> reform is not only changing a name. Lots of things has got to come into place. And I, and I read with great interest the statement from coming from Ben. Part of it is saying $14.3 billion for vehicles and, and, and for vehicles. And here it is in today's paper, Stabrook News, page 16, heading FM Bacchus Construction Donates Motorcycle to Police. And let me read it. For was Bacchus, the managing director of F MF Bacchus Construction and Transportation Service, located at Fairfield on the Escobar Coast, yesterday donated four new motorcycles to the Ghana Police Force Transport Department. The motorcycles be used in Region Police Division 2, number 2, according to a release from the police force. Deputy Commissioner Administration, I know we get it from Calvin Barnett, Masquer Calvin Brutus, Masquerading, receive a donation on behalf of the G GPF at the Tactical Service Unit Square, Yves Riyotun. Under the strategic pillar of partnership, the release said that the GPF continue to force and strengthen relationship with private sector and corporate donors to enhance and support safety, safer and more secure communities. And here what Baka said, Baka said, donating four motorcycles would aid the police, the GPF efforts in traffic enforcement and promoting public safety, especially in the regional division too. Here is it, $13.3 billion to purchase vehicles and you're taking donation from a businessman in India as if you course there. You're compromising yourself. Now let's go back to the reform. I remember I vividly, I remember Paul, vividly you were you are heading it, and then Ganu Green say, hey, now by me as the commissioner, I, I, I got to head it. 
I play a critical part of it, you know, because it had several components. And I got I come down to one. That was strategic management. We had a comprehensive training program, a one-year comprehensive training program, which I headed, which I saw to from beginning to end. And they had we had ISIS to know integrated crime information system where information from the divisions were inputted in, 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 in a computer and sent to, sent to, I think it was Ministry of Affairs, where they had what they call policy analysts looking at the figures and then coming up with information data to us on a, I think it was on a monthly basis. But Clement Roy used to give us it medicinally, bits and pieces, when the real control should have been at the police at, at the police headquarters. So far for that. Now, they had this comprehensive training program and then they had what you call a strategic unit. Capita Simmons, and I was part of it, submitted what they call a strategic management plan for the police force, 2011-2015. And they made some, or they, they submitted what they call some risk analysis. I think Ben should go back to that strategic plan. If he wants, I, 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 get, a, I get a copy available. Because I was I was part of it and they gave me a copy that if he wants he, he, he should go back to it and listen and read what they said because they had twenty five risk analysis I, I will give you some of them that the police must look at and that's what Ben must look at before we jump in all about change name change name ain't doing nothing you only changing the name and let me give you some of them there will be a lack of suitable equipment for office of the GPF to meet with new and emerging challenges. In example, increase marine air capacity, air capacity, improve vehicles. Two, the Ministry of Affairs does not have a strategic plan to give overall guidance to the GPF. Three, managers of the GPF will not be equipped to deal with new and emerging challenges arising from modernization. Four, there will be insufficient succession planning to ensure that skilled resources are in place to deal with the plan. Staff of the police force may, may be resistant to change, so the plan may not be achieved or will be delayed. And this one here, alleged and perceived corruption within the GPF will adversely affect the public trust and confidence in the police another one insufficient human resources will be made will be made available to the police to implement the plan another one an increase in the economy of Guyana may increase the demands of the GPF which cannot be managed with the existing resources we are a rich country and this one eh, the last one I'm gonna read there may be implications of the nature and type of criminality in Guyana as a result of increase in the population and or an, inc an influx of non Guyanese national. So all these things are there. And I would ask Ben to, to read them, to go over them, to have discussion with, 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 with his office them, so that if they look at these things here, they might be able to make the police, police force far better than what is. So changing the name, it's just a waste of time. It's just a, a wishy wishy arrangement. But go back to the plan. And, and they had the sitting security strengthening plan, but I think COVID 19 killed it. But they need to look properly at reform ball, properly at, at reform. And go back to the, the government spent a whole lot of money. It spent millions and millions of, of, of dollars on the citizen security plan. And perhaps all those things they did, they threw them in the dustbin. And they forget about them, and we're trying to reinvent the wheel. But you don't reinvent the wheel by, by just changing a name from police force to police service. Well said, my brother. Let me talk about some of the reform. Because you talk about reform. When I was heading that project, I had an interaction with Gail Tisher, who was for a period Minister of Home Affairs, relating to the reform. And I was asked a direct question in relation to specific officers. And I told her then 
that a reformed Guyana police force has no place for certain officers, and I name them. I name them. I say, if you're going to reform this police force, these people have got to go. And I told her, I said, it's not you're going to, we're not going to dismiss them. We're not going to dismiss them. Many of them are entitled to early retirement, but they got to go off. They got to go off because the force cannot be reformed when these people continue to be in the organization. And the same thing obtains today. Perhaps even um, it is even more relevant now that you cannot reform the Guyana police force when you have uh, people against whom credible allegations of corruption are made. You have people who are um, self-centered. You got two senior officers, Ikin and Brutus, applying for mining, sand mining concession on the IUA. The, the, the vice president said, don't it. Those things are conflict, conflict. You have, and you have so many others. You have an allegation that a senior police officer attempted to launder $16.5 million to the police uh, credit union. How are you going to reform with those people in key positions? I have said it repeatedly that if you want to reform, one of the things you got to start doing, you might ease out some people. They are bad for the image of the force. They are bad. They are corrupt. They are dishonest. They are unprofessional. And, they, and some of them are downright dunces. And they're there. They are just political puppets. And the organization cannot be reformed once they remain um, in those positions. I said so since when Nigel Lapi was there, um, there was an um, engagement with the prime minister at the Arthur Chung Convention Center. And I made that, I think I even wrote a letter about it. You cannot reform the force with certain people in it. And this is some studies, you know, studies. I I, 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 um, I think, CC, I had, I had loaned your book in the office of constable. In the office of constable, this was used as a guideline. This is a man from the Metropolitan Police Force in um, England. And that book was used as a guideline to reform police forces. As a matter of fact, one of the officers um, came to me while, when we were doing reform and, 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 and looking at the way forward for the force. That book was presented to me, was given to me as a gift by one of the um, persons who was on that team. So you can't, you cannot reform with those persons around. And when we talk about, somebody say, talk about remunerations, I you going to motivate people when, as, as it is now, let, let me I pull up the thing, the thing disappear. Let me find it back. You're talking about paying people allowances. Somebody talk about salaries and allowances. I had a chat with some of the allowances here. Permit me, let me, let me, let me see if I could find it back. Right? Uh, yes, here it is. Education allowance. And folks, what I'm telling you, this is not something, um, this is what happening now, you know. Education allowance in the Guyana Police Force is $320. Guyana dollars taxable, three hundred and twenty. And so when you take out the tax, you might come like about three fourteen. That's what you get for education allowance. If you have A levels, well, now it's not A levels, now it's CXC and so on. But A levels should be seventy five dollars. O levels fifty dollars. Right now, if you have a UG diploma, you are paid two hundred and fifty dollars. That is the education allowance you get for UG diploma. Meals allowance, meals allowance two thousand two hundred and fifty dollars a month. Laundry allowance for officers is five hundred Guyana dollars a month, and for inspectors is a hundred a thousand dollars. They have an allowance called proficiency allowance, forty dollars a month. Driving allowance if you're A grade driver you get six hundred dollars. If you're B grade driver you get four hundred. If you're C grade you get three hundred. House allowance ranges from four thousand five hundred to um, eleven thousand. I think it is. There's a mistake there. Separation allowance. If you're separated from your family, you are on those far from locations, they pay you two dollars and fifty cents a day for separation allowance. You have to leave your family. A guard in the bush, guard somewhere, one of those locations that entitled to separation allowance is um two dollars and fifty cents. And children, no, this is not April Fool joke. This is the real thing. When I got the information, I had to confirm that is what it is. Then you get station allowance. 
for specific locations like those areas in the interior border area you're getting two thousand four hundred to two thousand eight hundred dollars um station allowance per month two thousand four to two thousand eight per month risk allowance if you have some area risk allowance like people at the presidential guard put your life on the line for the president and other areas that deem to you have risk allowance is one hundred and fifty dollars to hundred and five dollars a month depending on your rank right uh, community there's a commuted overtime that they pay and what is the commuted overtime because you know police don't work eight hours 12 hours something longer than that so it ranges from seventeen thousand nine hundred and sixty dollars a month to four thousand four hundred dollars a month a detective allowance detective allowance for officer is one hundred dollars for inspector is eighty dollars for sergeants is seventy dollars and for constables is is uh fifty dollars a month that's what going on fifty guy no leslie ben is those are uh, those figures that i quoted there are all in guyana dollars so the fifty dollar a month what the detective constable getting as the detective of one uh, guyana dollars and we're saying that if you want to reform if you want to motivate people you got to look at all of these things not only changing the name and you make big nice that the name is changed and here, here, here what the minister said the name change aims to portray a better image of the organization and government members said it will benefit all Guyanese and according to Minister Ben, work is being done to ensure there's a smooth transition. A name change will portray a better image. How would a name change in and of itself portray a better image? Yes, it's done, these people done. You just change a name from force to service and there's a better image. And you get people laundering money. You get people brutalizing people. You get people involved in all type of acts of corruption. Not only police work, but in the government. And you want to tell me that this name change is going to portray a better image. Ben, take your medication, yeah? Take your medication. Something is wrong with you when you are making these foolish statements. And remember, this is not an isolated foolish statement made on All Fool's Day. We could have forgive you for, for saying that this is an All Fool's Day joke. But remember, you tell people that if they get an illegal firearm, put it in a bag and pass by the station and throw it in the yard. That's the way to deal with it. Put it in a bag, pass by the station and throw it in the yard. Remember, you have a fire scene telling the fire officers, train people that he, the, the, he, you shoot no dirty than them on. And they should tell the people to put the oars and the source of the fire and all them stupid statements you, 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 you have made. I, I said before, and I'm saying it again, it's time you take your risk. It's time you tell them this work is too much for you. Because I was about to say your credibility, but I don't think you have any credibility left. If perchance you have a little left, it is rapidly eroding. So you should really, really take a risk. Because you, you sound delusional when you're making these statements, and you're not the only one sounding delusional. Listen tomorrow, you're going to hear delusions of grandeur. You're going to hear them on the, on the, on the thing there. And they, and they said, we are looking to reform the police force into police service. Our commission staff have been diligently working to establish a police academy, complete with buildings and training facilities. We are complete with building and training facilities. So if you want to have an academy, it's about building and training facilities. What about the tra what were you teaching? What were your lecturers? What were your subjects and all of those type of things? Those things are not important. At least even if they are going on, it's not important for you to mention it. So you don't mention that. Then he said you address the need to improve leadership, particularly at the middle management level. Well, let me tell you something, given what's going on here now in the police force, not only at the management middle management level, because middle management were traditionally taught to be inspector, chief inspector, assistant superintendent, deputy superintendent level. That I think that was traditionally taught to be the middle management. But look above that. Look at the superintendent, senior superintendent, assistant commissioner, commissioner level. They need training too, perhaps even more than the ones below. They need training as well. So when you talk about training at levels, improve leadership, which is sadly lacking in the police force now, sadly lacking, Leadership is sadly lacking. You have to look at all of that. This has to be a comprehensive thing. 
not just changing the name from force to service and what are things are going to improve. They will not improve. They will not improve. So let me understand this. Mr. Conway, let me hear what you got to say on this. Let me just add to some of the things that you mentioned or restate some things for the sake of emphasis. And going back to the same strategic plan, 2011, Capita Simmons. And just to back up some of the things that, that they, they put in writing in the, in the plan. Alleged and perceived corruption within the GPF will adversely affect public trust and confidence in the police. And let me tell you a little story. Two weeks ago, I went to a certain police station. I, 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 I won't name it. And they were they had four traffic ranks inside there, and the girl in. And one warm man said, "Boy, I only scored eight points this morning. I gotta go back to the road and get some more points." And another one said, "Boy, don't give me ten points already." And you know they 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 are talking about points, about points. And then you know I I will inquire. So I made some inquiry later on. And when I, when I discovered that the, the pints they're talking about, when they say they make a pint, it's a thousand dollar bribe they're talking about. So once you only make eight pints in the morning, days, or you only get eight thousand dollars, and you gotta get two more for for for, for the day. So the corruption is there, and this one too, an increase in the economy of Ghana may increase the demands of the GPF, which which cannot be managed with existing resources when they when they wrote this document we we didn't we didn't strike oil perhaps they're the people out of vision now they're talking about increase in the economy of ghana may increase the demands of the gpf which cannot be managed with the existing resources they're not looking at that and this final one which i'm going to talk about there may be implications of the nature and type of criminality in ghana as a result of increasing the population and here is part of it and or the influx in the influx of non Guyanese national we get out of Venezuela and coming by the place we get also of Brazil and other thing there Venezuela and I think was more was more Venezuelan in, in the region one than than Guyanese in the place there. and they're not looking at those those things that Ben supposed to be looking at if, instead of talking about but change name and change name and change name. Change name won't do nothing. Look at the thing deeper. You got to look at the thing it, it, um, strategically, intellectually. You got you to look at it. But no, just go and blab that. Hey, we can change the name and everything will be all right. No, 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 no. Can't work. Can't work. It's a work. I said can't work. It can't work. Brenda saying, um, well, I'm going to say Brenda saying it. Brenda saying, um, Look out, you will get a mouth looking tomorrow. Let me let come bring it on. They never never take me up. So I really want them to take me up. So I'm going to listen out to you what they're going to say tomorrow. Because one of the things in closing, let me say this. President recently, um, speaking about the Guyana Power and Light, the situation with the electricity in Guyana, this un unstable electricity supply, every day is blackout. Every day. Do you know that the president is saying, that the previous administration is to be blamed. I saw a letter yesterday from the former Minister of Infrastructure, David Patterson, who outlines, and I recommend that you should read that. No one, no sensible, honest person can deny that during the um, coalition's tenure in office, 2015 to 2020, there was a stark improvement, a significant improvement in the electricity supply. Significant. And last year, the president went to Dominican Republic and they bought, I think they said about 17 Tordan generators. And this was to improve the electricity supply by Christmas 2023. This is April 2023. Now they're telling me some of them weren't installed because I think they said installed nine and all sorts of excuses they're making. All sorts of excuses, but that sector has retrogressed tremendously in the past couple of months. And then the one that knocks me out is the one somebody complained to me yesterday about the passport and immigration office. Master, he went there about 8 o'clock in the morning thinking that he was 
early. When he got there, there were hundreds and hundreds of people um, in the lines waiting to, to, to apply for passport or to uplift passport. He was shocked. And I, I have a similar experience because last year, around March last year, I had to renew. Uh, well, not renew. I had to get a new passport because passports now are not renewed. You get a new book. So I left um, my residence about 6.30 in the morning. I said I can get to there about 7 o'clock on an early. When I got to the passport office, there were literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people um, lined up. I waited a while. I waited. And I said, no, I can't wait anymore. I wait for the hour. And um, I had to go and make a few calls. And luckily, I got some help to get the, 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 the passport. But now, you're back to square one, where people have to wait for long, long hours, all day at the passport office, and then you might not get you. I recall, and you know, you have to give Jackie Jacket, because in the previous administration, they had created the Ministry of um, the, the, the Change Home Affairs and Ministry of Citizenship, and for retired Commissioner Felix headed that department. And it got, that place had gotten so efficient. It had gotten so efficient. I remember a very good businessman friend of mine called me one morning to tell me that he wanted a passport urgently and asked for my intervention. And I said to him, there's no need for me to intervene. You'd go to the passport office and tell them that you want an expedited passport. You pay, I think it was 100 US more, and you get it the same day. The man couldn't believe. I said, yes. I said, if you go there and you ain't get you with that, then you could call me. I could see what I could do. And the man called me back um, the afternoon. The man said he couldn't believe. He went there in the morning. He made the application. They told him, I think it was $20,000 for the expedited process. And he should come back 3 o'clock in the afternoon. He went back and he got his passport. That system had become so efficient. And let me say this. It has nothing to do with the ranks at the Immigration and Passport Office. Those ranks remain very, very efficient. Those of us who have had an encounter with them at the airport or at the ports and at the main office will tell you they're very courteous, they're very efficient. But if the government don't ensure that they have the relevant books and relevant materials, what do you expect them to do? They can't make bread out of stone. So the, 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 the blame lies squarely on the shoulders of the government with that fiasco at the passport and immigration office. It's the government and people have said, all the teachings, have said that once you get that type of situation, it leads to corruption because people are going to be willing then to make offers. And some people who are not very, some people who are unscrupulous are going to accept uh, the offers. But if you have a smooth system as you had prior to 2020, there was no need for that. You go in. And I remember well, you go in on a Monday, they tell you come back on Friday afternoon. It was five working days. You get your passport. You don't have to talk to anybody. You don't have to bribe anybody. You go in, you make your application. Five business days, you get your passport. If you want it the same day, then you pay the expedited, the cost of the expedited process, and you get it the very afternoon. So that's what we have. Retrogression under this administration, and they blame everybody else. We have so much more that we could talk, but we are almost at two hours. So let me bring in Mr. Kame to make his closing remarks. And then we are going to wrap for today. CC, your closing remarks, please. I know you would want to say something about the passport office too. Yeah, I, I, I endorse the sentiment, you know, that Superintendent Telford and the staff, they're doing an excellent job, eh? an excellent job. And I think about two months ago, they had a good system that within a week you, you, you get your passport. But something has, has, has gone, gone wrong now and you got to wait a, a long time now to get a passport. And they're among the persons there that they have to close off when the mid-morning there's a cut-off time they say hey, we're not doing anything anymore i don't know if it's a shortage of passport or or what but i know that the staff there they're doing a very good work they're doing excellent work and they're very courtesy is the hail mark of, of them there and a bit of the few you know a senior person from gpl talked to me two days ago you know he said with all what they're saying there he said one of the major problems with GPL, you know them generators and working good, they bring total generators and all kind of things. He said, but one of the major problems is that they're buying cheap fuel and the fuel is dirty. 
and the fuel constantly blacking up the filters. And right now he said I run out of filters. So let's be saying, I don't know how true it is. He said they're buying cheap fuel. The fuel is dirty. The fuel blacking up the filters. And they got changed filter regularly. And right now they have they, they run they have they run short of fuel of filters. And let me, you know, I always have to focus on Barbies. Um the guy, I think Sigo Ben his name, who was charged since I think in June last year for sexual offense. I understand he was finally recently served with his interdiction notice after maybe over about six months. Then he really he got he got his his notice. And talking about Bobby Steno, a plane to the to the, the police high command. Somebody please senior body please go to borbis and resolve the situation at divisional headquarters it's tense it's going to get explosive it's going to get out of hand you see when you when you promote incompetence and act and ask incompetent people to command situation because of political reasons or because of racial reasons all kind of thing will happen so i'm playing Somebody, I'm not going to say what I want to say, but somebody need to get the Borbies, I command, and other people together, and maybe have some face-to-face -face discussion with them. Talk to them. Have a shootout. Things going to get out of hand. And don't be surprised if maybe one of these days you hear gunplay at the place there. That's all I want to say. Well, I, 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 in respect to that, I believe what you got to start to do is put competent people too. If you get incompetent people, that is going to always happen. They feel insecure and they are going to lash out. Somebody asked about the, 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 the $100 for the expedited process. It was a legitimate process. You got a receipt for your money and all of that. So it, it wasn't anything on the hand. You went there and you indicated that you wanted an expedited process and the, the system facilitated that. So nothing untoward, and it happens in other countries as well. You want an expedited document, you pay more and you get it. You pay more and you get it. Now, let me say this in closing, folks. Um, two hours, all our two hours time fly when you're having fun, when right? you're bringing valuable and credible information to people. Um, we promise you makeup, but we're not going to be able to do it this week because, as I said, tomorrow morning, I may quote with this. Um, Trumped up sexual assault charge. Just to remind you, uh, the matter is sent back to the chief magistrate who is expected to reassign the matter to another magistrate. This is what we have. The matter was before magistrate in court three. And last year, or January, I think it was, she said she, um, in the interest of justice, she don't believe that she should um, inquire into the matter. She sent it back to the chief magistrate and tomorrow at 10 o'clock, the chief magistrate is supposed to then reassign the matter to some other magistrate. And we are waiting. I'm waiting to hear uh, what will happen then. So it's going to be reassigned. And no doubt when it's reassigned to the next magistrate, a date will be given uh, for report. So we are, I am um, following up on that. So because of that, maybe next week we're going to be able. So as it is now, our next program will be on Monday, that is Monday coming. I think Monday is eight now. Yeah. And um, until then, again, we urge you to stay safe. Stay safe in Guyana. Road accidents, fires, robberies, all kind of things are going on. And you need to protect yourself at all times. That is what the um, referee used to tell you protect yourself at all times. So, God's willing. God's willing, we have to put everything uh, in his hands. God's willing, see you again on Monday at 11 o'clock for another episode of Speaking Out, Exposing Corruption and Incompetence. Until then, have a good um, time. Bye.